that really was what it was about. And in 1969, their reign of terror was finally halted by the smallest man in the Met, Nipper Reed. Welcome, Nipper. Thanks a lot Thank for coming you. in. It feels a bit rude to call you Nipper. I feel I should be calling you Mr. Everyone Reed. Everyone else does. Uh, they all right. Well, I'll, even the craze, I gather. Yeah. <laughs> The actual operation to finally get them, after a previous one had failed, because you tried to get them for blackmail, but yeah. that, that had fallen through and they were acquitted, was actually extremely delicate, because you had to get a lot of witnesses together, and the craze didn't know, they weren't to That's know. right. That That's must right. have been the trickiest part of the whole operation, it keeping was. from them. It was. It, it started off in a very small way, really. I started off with two sergeants, and then built it up gradually to ten, and that was the, the final number that we employed on the investigation until they were arrested. But you had 200 officers protecting the witnesses. Later, protecting the witnesses because that was so important. Yeah. And one of the other things that, that I uh, insisted upon was that we didn't investigate the murders. There were three murders that were for investigation, but until they were arrested and locked up and, and away from damage they could do to witnesses, I insisted that we didn't investigate that because I was sure that they would learn about that and that witnesses would disappear. More murders. So how, mm. More murders. So how, how did you get the witnesses to come forward? I mean, how did you manage to convince them that your protection would be adequate? Well, it was difficult because, don't forget, I, I, I'd enjoyed the experience of investigating them previously, so people knew me. Yeah. And that was important. I think people had got confidence in me. But a lot of the, a lot of the witnesses were sort of involved in the underworld themselves. Indeed, they were well acquainted yeah. with you. Yeah. 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 The thing about the craze was, I mean, they knew no fear, did they? I mean, and they didn't, they didn't give a snap of fingers for the police. I mean, in fact, one of the first convictions was for assaulting the police. Yes, that's, that's right. So did you feel personally that at any moment your life might be in danger? Oh, it was. There's no question about that. I mean, I learned that very graphically when I went to interview a man in prison who said that he was a very wealthy businessman, but nevertheless involved with them in fraud. And he told me quite categorically that he'd been asked to put up £50,000 to get me and another, one of the main witnesses, eliminated. So there was no doubt in my mind about the, the fact that they had seen me as a target. Yeah. One of the things, I think, about the British public attitude to, to notorious criminals is that they tend to glamorise them. We all tend to glamorise them and think they're really awfully nice chaps. It's happened to Ronnie Biggs. Yes. And it's also happened to the craze. They're, they're seen as really, despite being brutal, yes. quite charming and friendly. Were they charming and friendly? They were very charming and friendly to a certain section of the, of the public. You see, I saw a film recently with uh, or a, an interview with Barbara Windsor, who said they were really nice chaps. Yes. Well, they probably were to her. Yeah. She wasn't affected by their violence, by their intimidation, well, by Hitler, their Hitler was quite pleasant to That's certain right. people, wasn't he? That's right. Mm, yeah. But you see, that was only a facade. That was the, 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 uh, the view they pro projected to people. And uh, underneath all of that, of course, was this reign of absolute terror, which, which controlled the East End in a vice-like grip. Now, when you were pursuing them then, and you were, and you were being very specific about the charges that you wanted to, to bring on them, to get them locked away, I'm sorry about that, but locked away for, for good and all, were you doing that because of the threat they posed to people? Obviously, partly it was that. Or did, did you feel you were on a crusade against the evil? Well, no, it wasn't a crusade, but it, it was certainly uh, an investigation that had to succeed because of the size of their organisation. Yeah. We just got rid of the Richardsons, the other big gang in London, yeah. and so it was the time that the craze had to be really carefully looked at. And so that was one of the reasons, of course, that, that we built it up fairly slowly. And it went over a long period of time working on the, on the frauds and, and things of that kind. But we took a long time to, yeah. to investigate and research. Uh, we're talking on the programme today, among other things, our phone-in is about uh, people's opinions of the police at the moment, in the light of all these scandals about wrongful convictions. Mm. Um, when you were in the Met, in your book, you didn't actually accuse anyone of corruption, but you did say that it was rife with petty jealousies, yes. internal rivalries, yes. and you suffered from that. Well, I did. And of course there was a, a, a very strong element of corruption during my service in the Met, because if you remember there was, uh, there was all the, what they call the porn squad investigation mm. and yeah. th things like that, which absolutely horrified me because if somebody had asked me a week before and mentioned the kind of figures that were supposedly going into the po money that was going into the pockets of the commanders and the chief superintendents, I, I wouldn't have believed it. So it was hidden in that sense. You see, one gets the impression that when a, when a big corruption ring is exposed in a particular force, that other officers, even though they weren't involved in it, as you most certainly would never have been, would possibly have been aware of it, but had simply decided not, 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 to, not to follow it well, up. Are you saying it was well hidden? It was, it was certainly well hidden. The, the, I mean, it was very well organised, you know, with, with people of that rank yeah. involved in it, as it must have been. Well, you're 16 years out of the force now, so you can't speak with any direct personal experience. 
What do you think about the reputation of the police today? Well, I think there's never been a time when the reputation uh, of the police has been at a lower ebb. The confidence of, the, of the, the, the public have lost all confidence in the police simply because uh, at, at a time when a disaster happens, in other words, there's a, a, an allegation of corruption or an allegation of a fit-up or, or, or a, a conviction is overturned mm. and so on. Mm. It, the, the odd time that it happened, the police, could, the, the public could could uh, assimilate that and accept it. And the so odd one, these, these, these are yeah. just the the, the, few, the few. Now there's been this avalanche of uh, of a series of, of problems, and so I'm sure that at the moment the the uh, the police images at the lowest ebb and yeah. what they've got to do now is to get back work hard mm -hmm. uh, and give an honest uh, opinion of themselves back to the public and and do the job that they're paid to do and as a public servant but you agree that there is a problem and it's got to be addressed oh indeed there's a problem i mean it's very obvious i mean that it's an overgeneralization because we can't say well all the police are corrupt all the police not, no, are, no. because there aren't there are many many hundreds and hundreds of of good, honest police and doing a good day's work. But uh, even they would admit that at the moment the, the confidence of the public must be abysmal. Just one more question on this, very quickly. What do you think, from your experience and the, and, the, and the policeman that you've known in your very long career, what is the motivation, not for taking bribes, I'm not talking about that kind of corruption, but for deliberately and knowingly fitting somebody up, as the phrase has it? Why do they do it? Just to be successful, just to get a conviction. Having, I'm sure, satisfied themselves that that the people that they're doing this to are guilty of the crime. They they assume uh, the position of judge and jury and yes. say, well, this man is guilty, and so therefore the evidence is sparse. I've got to add that little bit more to it. Right. And we must Which get is on, but, disastrous. But yeah. is, is there a lot of pressure on the police to secure a conviction? No. 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 I mean, each individual uh, investigator is his own man, and he makes his mind up about whether he can get the evidence or not, and that's what they right. should do, get the evidence. So there's no league table for anything? Oh, no, no, no. no. no, no. Okay, all right. Thank you very much indeed. I feel rude calling you Nipper as well, but this is because <laughs> I will. Thank you very much indeed. Good. And uh, Nipper, of course, was talking about police work in the 50s and 60s, but what about the 90s? We look at the state of... Uh,